Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is March 31st, 2021. This is part six of my video series, Passover, not Easter. Uh, now, most of you realize that last Friday evening through Saturday was Passover for this year. I celebrated Passover um, Saturday evening with a wonderful uh, meal of lamb with my wife my and my youngest two children. And then the next day, Sunday, we had a Seder dinner, uh, an, another Passover dinner at a friend's house close by. So it was really a wonderful weekend. And some of you are probably thinking, well, why are you still talking about Passover? <clears throat> well, a couple of reasons. One reason is that this Friday is Good Friday, according to the church, and this coming Sunday is Easter Sunday. And most Christians will continue with their tradition of celebrating those two days rather than the biblical holiday of Passover. The word Easter does not occur in the Bible. Um, men substituted the word Easter for the word Pesach in, uh, I believe it was Acts chapter 12, Acts chapter 12, verse 4. The word is Pesach, and yet they translate that Easter in the King James Version of the Bible, and uh, I think other versions of the Bible, but I have not checked recently into that. <clears throat> Anyway, Easter really is a pagan holiday. It is um, a holiday to Ishtar. Um, you can also think of the Asherah poles that were worshipped by the Canaanites before Israel was uh, allowed into that land by God under the rule of Joshua just after Moses died. This is part six of this video series, and this one is entitled The Man-Child. And, well, I didn't quite uh, finish saying why this is still relevant. Recently, I did a video called The Hidden Feast, and I would uh, encourage you to go back and listen to that one. It deals with the hidden feast of second Passover. I think I'll probably be doing some um, videos specifically related to Second Passover because what we're moving into now really, well actually this video today uh, on the man-child is, I believe, dealing with Second Passover. And Second Passover occurs in April. It's going to be this coming uh evening of April 25th into the day of April 26th. And then the actual fulfillment of second Passover is going to be the glorification of the first fruits. And I've talked about the first fruits and the firstborn, especially in the last video. But this is going to continue with that and add more insights to that. So, what we've seen in the videos so far is that Passover is primarily dealing with the first fruits, the firstborn, the overcomers of God, the Kodeshim, the holy ones. We saw in the last video that God decreed 14 specific regulations concerning Passover. And we saw that each one of these mandates prophetically looked forward to particular spiritual applications in God's overcomers. The specific overcomers who would one day be chosen as part of the man-child. The man-child is that spiritual body prophesied by John in Revelation chapter 12. In verses 4 through 6, it says, And the dragon stood before the woman, 
who was ready to be delivered, to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. To rule all nations with a rod of iron. I want you to remember back to Jesus' words to the church of Thyatira, to the overcomers in that church, that those overcomers would rule with a rod of iron. This is the same group of people. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. One thousand two hundred sixty days. The woman is going to be fed there. And I believe she's going to be fed by the man-child. For many years, I've thought that the man-child and the bride of Christ were the same. Just two different terms representing different aspects of God's overcomers. It was a few years ago, about eight, that God showed me that these two groups make up separate and distinct groups of overcomers. I believe that Passover relates to the first of these groups, the man-child, and that the Feast of Pentecost relates mainly to the Bride of Christ. I believe the Bride of Christ is the woman who flees into the wilderness in the passage above in Revelation chapter 12. Now I want to try to show this concept, the spiritual concept from the scriptures. When Moses first announced Passover to Israel, he said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight will I go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sits upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of the beasts. That's Exodus 11, verses 4 and 5. The Hebrew word translated firstborn here comes from the Hebrew word bekor and means firstborn or eldest son, according to Strong's. This Hebrew word is a masculine noun and thus refers to the firstborn male of a family, not to the firstborn female. The fact that Passover related only to male firstborns can be further proven by comparing Exodus 13, 1 with Numbers 3, verses 39 to 43. This is important because we're talking about the man-child, a male, from Revelation chapter 12. In Exodus 13, verse 1, God announces that every firstborn which opens the womb of both man and beast shall be his. In Numbers 3, 39 to 43, God substitutes the consecrated firstborn males of Israel with all the males of the tribe of Levi. The Hebrew word sakar, which means male, actually occurs right next to the Hebrew word for firstborn in this passage. And I'm quoting here from Numbers 3, verse 40. It says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Number all the firstborn of the males of the children of Israel from a month old and upward and take the number of their names. Again, that was Numbers 3, verse 40, specifically mentioning male, the firstborn males. The fact that only males are in view becomes crystal clear in the following passage. And here I'm reading from Exodus uh, 13, verses 11 to 15. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers, and shall give it to you, you shall set apart to the Lord all that first opens the womb. All the firstborn of your animals that are males shall be the Lord's. Every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. And when in time to come your son asks you, What does this mean? You shall say to him, By a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. 
For when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of animals. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first open the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons, that is of the males, I redeem. So that's Exodus 13, verses 11 through 15. Thus, those who qualify to rule with a rod of iron as the man-child described in Revelation 12, verses 4 through 6, fulfill Passover by walking in the 14 Passover regulations we reviewed in the last video in this series. These will have qualified for rule by a lifetime of testing and tribulation. They will have learned to discern good from evil and have determined to choose good. Although they do not yet live in sinless perfection, that is their goal, their deepest heart desire. They yearn to be perfect as their Father in heaven is perfect. And they mourn that they still dwell in bodies of sinful flesh. These are the sons of whom Isaiah prophesied. And it's a mystery. This is Isaiah chapter 7, verses 10 through 15. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. Sheol is the Hebrew word for hell. The place of the dead. The same as the Greek Hades. So it's the place of the dead. But Ahaz said, I will not ask and I will not put the Lord to the test. And the prophet answered, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. Isaiah chapter 7 verses 10 through 15. Jesus, of course, according to Matthew 1, verses 22 and 23, first fulfilled this prophecy. Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, and he was, in fact, God with us, which is what the name Emmanuel literally means. Emmanuel means God with us. But like many prophecies, this one also will receive a double fulfillment. In the next chapter in Isaiah, Isaiah again speaks of Emmanuel. Verse 5 in chapter 8, beginning there, says, The Lord spoke to me again. Because this people has refused the waters of Shiloah that flow gently, and they rejoice over Rezin and the son of Ramalia, those are the uh, kings of Assyria. Therefore, behold, the Lord is bringing up against them the waters of the river, mighty and many, the king of Assyria and all his glory. And it will rise over all its channels and go over all its banks, and it will sweep on into Judah. It will overflow and pass on, reaching even to the neck, and its outspread wings will fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. That was verses 5 through 8. But I want to continue reading from this chapter of Isaiah because this is filled with prophecy that is very relevant to the times that we live in. So continuing with verse 9, Be broken, you peoples, and be shattered. Give ear, all you far countries. Strap on your armor and be shattered. Strap on your armor and be shattered. Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak a word, but it will not stand, for God is with us. For Emmanuel, God is with us. Right now, Babylon the Great is trying to place us into great fear. Babylon the Great is flexing her muscle. Babylon the Great is making laws and rules and regulations that would hinder, would forbid 
living as a free person in this country and in this world. Babylon the Great wants to make you take a, a particular prick in the arm, a prick in the arm that would potentially change your DNA, your RNA. would, in my opinion, affect you and harm you for the rest of your life. Now, men have taken or not taken the mark of the beast for millennia because the mark of the beast is what you think and what you put your hand out to do. And most people, including most Christians, have taken the mark of the beast in order to make money, in order to be popular, in order to get the things that they want. But is it possible that this new pinprick that they're making everyone want to receive, could that be a type of the mark of the beast? Or could it actually be the the end time fulfillment of the mark of the beast. The point, <clears throat> the point is we are there. This is the end of the age. We are, in, we are in the battle of Armageddon and we have been in this battle for a long time. This is the battle for your mind. You'd never hear the truth. Those who control the world, those who control the airwaves, never speak the truth. Just remember what the head of the CIA, Casey, was his last name, said in 1981 in a meeting with Ronald Reagan just before they nearly killed Reagan, nearly assassinated him. Casey said, the head of the CIA, and this is documented, we will know that we have been successful when everything the American people believe is a lie. Do you believe that? Do you, do you realize how many lies you have believed and how many lies you have in your head now? See, it's very difficult to know the truth. And this is in fulfillment of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that God gives them a spirit of deception because they refuse to love the truth. Only the Kodeshim absolutely love the truth. That is one of the, the marks of the Kodeshim. They absolutely love the truth. <clears throat> then moving on here in Isaiah 8, verse 11. For the Lord spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me and warned me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, Don't call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. And do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Verse 14, and he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. And then <clears throat> one of um, my favorite verses because it's become a theme in my later years. Isaiah 8, verse 16. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob and I will hope in him. I, I wait for the Lord and I bind up the testimony and the law in my heart and I speak according to that. Revelation chapter 19 
verse 12, I believe it is, says, The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The entire Bible is the testimony of Jesus. Jesus was the rock that went with Moses, the rock that provided the water to the people. The entire scripture speaks of Jesus and the entire scripture is the word of Jesus. It was given by Jesus to his prophets to bear witness to himself. The testimony is a historical record that is true. And it is a testimony of the Redeemer of Israel, the Redeemer of God's people. Jesus redeemed us with his blood from the dominion of Satan. We had been sold to Satan for our sin. Israel was sold to Egypt for their sin. God redeemed them from slavery in Egypt. All of the word of God deals with the redemption of God's people. It's a redemption from slavery to sin. Redemption into the kingdom of light. That is the testimony. Bind up the testimony and seal the law among my disciples. In the book of Revelation, at the end, you have the people of God, the Kodeshim, who are singing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. It's because you have to know them both. See, I couldn't walk with God at all if I didn't know his law. But I'm not a legalistic person. In other words, I don't, I don't just come up with laws for the sake of saying, in order to fellowship with me, you've got to do this, 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 and this. I only say things like, you shall not steal, you shall not murder, you, sh you shall not commit adultery, you shall not lie. Things like that. And that's the type of thing that Paul taught us to judge within our midst, within the church. And the song of the Lamb, of course, the mercy of God, the, the mercy of God. The law teaches us justice. Mercy teaches us righteousness. Justice and righteousness are two sides of the same coin. Then verse 17, Isaiah 8, verse 17. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. See, God hides his face from most people because they really don't seek him. And then verse 18, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. That's a picture of New Jerusalem, Mount Zion. But who is this I? Who is I and who are the children that God gave to that person who is designated I here in Isaiah 8:18. 8, the Hebrew word yeled is translated children in verse 18 above. But according to Strong's, the word literally means sons. The I in this verse refers to Jesus. I, Glenn, I believe the man-child will thus consist of Jesus' own sons, the children whom the Lord gave him. In another verse, it's called brothers. 
uh, in the book of Hebrews, you have that. This is that which Paul prophesied in Ro Romans 8, starting in verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And still, until now, 2,000 years later. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for placement as sons, the redemption of our bodies, the glorification of our bodies, so that we will be like him. We will see him as he is. Years ago, when I first began thinking that the man-child and the bride of Christ were two separate groups of Christians, the Lord took me to the following passage. This is from Isaiah 66. This starts uh, with verse 7. So Isaiah 66, 7 through 14. Before she was in labor, she gave birth. Think of that. Before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came upon her, she delivered a son. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall a land be born in one day? Shall a nation be brought forth in one moment? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she brought forth her children. Shall I bring to the point of birth and not cause to bring forth, says the Lord? Shall I who cause to bring forth shut the womb, says your God? Rejoice with Jerusalem, New Jerusalem, and be glad for her, all you who love her. We have to quit thinking in terms of the natural. So many Christians are deceived by the natural Jerusalem and they're looking for a temple to be built there. And the scripture is talking about New Jerusalem. Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad for her, all you who love her. Rejoice with her in joy, all you who mourn over her, that you may nurse and be satisfied from her consoling breast, that you may drink deeply with delight from her glorious abundance. For thus says the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the nations like an overflowing stream. And you shall nurse, you shall be carried upon her hip and bounced upon her knees. As one whom his, his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. You shall see and your heart shall rejoice. Your bones shall flourish like the grass and the hand of the Lord shall be known to his servants and he shall show his indignation against his enemies. That was Isaiah 66 verses 7 through 14. And then I was reminded again of Revelation 12, 5 that says, she gave birth to a man child, to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And I thought, certainly the she in these two passages, that is from Isaiah and Revelation 12, cannot be the bride of Christ, for she is not yet married. Surely she cannot have a baby until after she is married, right? And it was after this that the Lord showed me the sign of Emmanuel. Just as Mary was not yet married when she became pregnant, and just as Joseph and Mary did not consummate their marriage until after Jesus was born, so shall it be with the bride of Christ. Today, those in the church who, who will be called out of that church do not even know that they are spiritually pregnant. When they first see the manifestation of the sons of God, that is the man-child, they will ponder in their hearts if this truly could be 
the sons of God, which Paul predicts. Because if they are, then they would, in fact, be God with us, which is what Emmanuel means. Remember also that when Mary heard and saw Jesus do certain things, she pondered those things in her heart. Mary is a type of the bride of Christ. So yes, it appears from Scripture that the son of the bride comes to maturity before the bride. And this occurs before the bride makes herself ready and before the marriage supper of the Lamb. <clears throat> See, the, the reality is that most people are not yet ready for the return of the Lord. For some strange reason, they still think that the return of the Lord is a long way off. They're still trying to build an earthly kingdom. That's why you have so many Christians who are all in an uproar about the, um, <clears throat> the evil legislation that is being promulgated by the current Congress and the current uh, alleged president of America. But we are at the end. It is time for the glorification of the first fruits. It is time for the birthing of the man child. And this is true whether or not Biden continues or. President Trump comes back. You need to, if you have not, you need to uh, go through my video series, The Mystery of the Beast, in which I reveal who Donald Trump really is. And um, as I've said many times, I support, supported him, still support him, because I believe that he has been anointed by God to do the work that he's doing, which is to destroy Babylon the Great. Nevertheless, the scripture does say that the eighth beast, the eighth head of the beast, who I believe is Donald Trump, will persecute the saints, will persecute the Kodeshim, and will even implement the mark of the beast. So, um, Since the eighth head of the beast and the beast that rises from the earth, the false prophet, make everyone take the mark of the beast or else they cannot buy or sell. The people who refuse to take the mark of the beast will die unless they are provided for. I believe that the man-child, the glorified man-child, is going to be that provision. That there will be at least 144,000 of those beings on the earth. They will have places prepared to which the bride can escape to, can go for sustenance, for safety. It's going to be a terrifying time. Look at look at everything that's happening. Look, you've never we've never seen anything like this. And unfortunately, it's going to occur whether Biden or Trump is leading the United States. We this is where we're at. This is where we're at. But it is time for God to act. In a type, we are at the Red Sea with Pharaoh, with Satan at our back, ready to kill us. And there's nowhere for us to go. So God has to part the sea and God has to destroy Satan and his army. 
And that's what exactly what you see in Revelation chapter 19. Now, it really does appear as if there's going to be a three and, three and a half year period of time in which the first fruits, sons of God, the, the man child, will provide for the faithful Christians who refuse the mark of the beast. And that those faithful Christians, then, they will partake in the marriage of the Lamb that we see at the beginning of chapter 19. And then they and the other Kodashim, the man-child, come back after that marriage supper in order to destroy the beast and his kingdom. These are biblical days we live in. But fear not. Fear not because God is with us. God is with us.